Hello everyone, Sinter here, and today I'm going to start what's going to be the first introductory part of a rather lengthy series where I'm going to review all of the Guild Wars 1 skills. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I want to do this, and for those who may follow me elsewhere, you might have seen that on uh, my blog at Sinter.com, I in fact started this exact idea. And my purpose for this is multifaceted. One of the important ideas of going into this is because I think reviewing or, or examining or analyzing these things has use from a game design perspective. It's useful to try to think about what works, what doesn't, why, and all of these sorts of things. What makes a skill good or bad, or how an environment works. So I want to look at all of the skills in part for that purpose. Another reason why I want to do it is because I want to uh, rate all of the skills for a program I want to make. And I figured this is a good way of doing a little bit more than just that. Specifically, the, the program is to randomly generate skill pools that are roughly balanced. So to do this, I'm going to need to go over some basics about how the game works. Just that way, it's in a place, it's there, people can look at it, see how everything goes. And uh, there is a more comprehensive post on my blog at cntier.com. There will be a link to it in the description and in the card. But uh, this is going to kind of give you a bit of an overview. So there's a number of different categories that I need to go into. And so I'm going to discuss a number of them. Uh, but before I do, just a, a quick note. I've decided to do it in video format rather than through the articles just because I felt like the overhead involved in creating these those articles was a bit too high for what this project is, and going through it in something like this is, is probably a bit better. So let's just go ahead and start with some basics about how this game works. The most important part of this game is your skill bar and your attributes in terms of making a, a build, which is part of how everything functions. Now I'm out in an explorable area. Uh, the game is separated into outposts where you can change your build and those sorts of things. And all I can do here is just rearrange my skills. I can't actually change them. I'm going to be doing some stuff out here later. But a quick overview of some of this. Uh, actually, it might be best if I go back into town to do this. Uh, this would be the fast way. So the uh, skills that I have equipped are... Uh, I get eight of them. They are attached to attribute lines. So, for example, Divine Favor is an attribute line. And the skill effectiveness scales with that attribute. So if you look at Signet of Devotion right now, uh, you can see its attribute is Divine Favor, and it heals for 83 health. If I reduce my Divine Favor, it will go down to 77 health, uh, etc. Now, this number is blue because I have a rune. So this is let, let's take a moment to talk about armor. So there are five armor slots and armor conveys certain properties. Uh, so if you look, once I take all my armor off, I have 35 energy with two pips of energy regeneration. I'll get into that in a bit. And 480 health. This is base stats. Uh, also, all of the blue has gone away. Armor pieces have things that can increase your attributes above and beyond where your attribute points are. So if you notice, I have one unused attribute point. Normally, you have 200 uh, total attribute points for a, a fully developed character. You get them as you level up. There's only 20 levels in the game. The game's really designed around being max level uh, for the most part. So I can put these attribute points however I want in, in, in any of these, uh, and it costs more attribute points to go up in higher levels. So if you look here, I've put a few in everything. Everything's going to be really weak at this level. The maximum I can put in anything is 12, uh, to rank 12, I should say. So, it costs one point to go up to rank one, two points, three points, four points, etc. Um, at a certain point, yeah, here, six points to go to rank six, seven points to go to rank seven. Rank eight costs nine points. Rank nine costs 11, 13, 16, and then 20. So, it's a very big investment to get to 20. Um, you can... Uh, continue going up by equipping things that give you rune. runes and other benefits like this headpiece has divine favor plus one stacking so that'll stack with other things that increase divine favor whereas the healing prayers has uh that's a rune so you can see it's a dragon scalp design of minor healing prayers that minor is referring to a minor rune which increases the attribute by one 
there are, uh, I don't know if this character has them, but there are uh, superior and major runes. Um, they increase for more, but they have the downside of reducing your maximum health. So whether or not you use them varies. There are some that don't. Uh, for example, this chest piece uh, has superior vigor, which is just straight plus 50 HP. So uh, each of these slots, by the way, just to cover armor a little bit, it has two modification slots. One is the insignia. So you see this is blessed. That gives the plus 10 armor while affected by an enchantment spell. And then the rune is the other one. In this case, minor healing prayers. I can actually take a look here at this rune trader who will be able to show what these all kind of do. So these are insignia. These are specifically for monks. Uh, because this character is a monk, uh, she'd be able to use these on her armor. Mm, I'll get into these a little bit more. They have general effects that are useful. Uh, then we have runes. So y each attribute has a rune of plus one. Uh, that's a minor. A major gets plus two, but minus 35 maximum HP. And then a superior, which is plus three, but minus 75 HP. Uh, then there's some generic runes. So there's runes that give you more maximum HP. Uh, so like Vitae stacks with other ones, Minor Vigor does not stack with other Vigor runes, Attunement does stack with other Attunement runes, uh, then there's some that reduce the duration of conditions, we'll talk about them more later, uh, and then there's some generic Insignia, so like Survivor's Insignia gives you plus additional health, all Insignia stack, but what's really important to understand is that armor is not cumulative in this game, it's on a per piece basis, so this plus 10 armor on this piece while affected by an enchantment spell does not affect my entire character. It only affects it if my character is hit in the head. Uh, hit, where your hit is random, uh, it's broken up into eight parts. One eighth each for the head, uh, feet, and arms. Three eighths for the chest and two eighths for the legs. Uh, and various runes like the survivor rune reflect that fact so this survivor gives plus 10 hp this one gives plus 15 and the ones on the arms only give plus five uh, just because you're giving up more protection by putting a, a, a plus hp insignia when you could potentially be putting on say a blessed to give you plus an armor while enchanted so that's kind of how armor works in general it does have additional properties you'll see this here says plus one energy recovery that means i get an additional pip of energy regeneration uh, those pips of energy regeneration affect the rate at which your energy regenerates as you'd expect uh, it is one third energy per second per pip so i can uh, go and show you that later when i get back to the outpost that's a quick overview of armor so your attribute lines um, you increase them you can change them while an outpost to figure out what you want there are some common splits uh, the most common ones being, uh, I guess, uh, no, that one. Try, sorry, just trying to think through how I wanted these. Uh, the most common ones being uh, 10, 10, 11, or 12, 10, 8. Those are the ones that I see most commonly, although you could do other ones, of course, if you wanted. I also need to talk about primary attributes. So if I look at my character here, Divine Favor is kind of special. If I add another hero, let's say Master of Whispers, you'll notice he doesn't have Divine Favor in his attribute list. That's for a good reason. Divine Favor is a primary attribute, and for each rank of Divine Favor, there's a special bonus. In this case, allies are healed an additional amount per point in Divine Favor whenever I cast a monk spell on them. Every profession has a primary attribute. For example, warriors have strength, which gives them armor penetration on attack skills. Necromancers have soul reaping, which gives them energy when things die. These are an important part of each profession and do have a big influence on how each one plays and the strength of relative skills. For example, monks using monk healing skills are stronger than anyone else using monk healing skills. This affects a lot of build stuff that you'll see. For example... Um, ritualists have uh, healing spells as well under restoration magic. These prayers, uh, these spells are calibrated to not have the effect of 
uh, divine favor in their balancing. So this right here is a ritualist heal. This is the sort of standard ritualist heal spell. It heals for 140. If we look over here, sort of the standard-ish comparable one in healing prayers is probably Orison of Healing, which is generally not considered a great spell. You can see that it only heals for 60, but it heals for an additional, uh, what is this going to be, 32 plus 6, so like 38 HP. So this is actually healing for almost 100 hit points. It's not quite comparable. Orison of Healing has a quicker recharge, and Spirit Light has a longer one, and maybe a little bit of health sacrifice, depending upon whether or not you have the spirits have spirits around. But... And I'll go into a lot of that stuff later on those individual professions. But the basic point is a ritualist would never want to use Orson of Healing because it would be super weak. With a monk, it's at least does something. You still wouldn't want to use it, but I'll get into that more when I talk about individual spells or individual skills. But it's just important to know that the primary attribute has a specific effect. And I'll go into each profession's primary attribute in that video. But just be aware of it. You do not get it when you become a secondary uh, so secondary professions also I should touch on a little bit more. You get access to all skills in your secondary profession. However, you cannot use armor from your secondary profession. You can only use armor from your primary profession. This has a few ramifications. One, if your secondary profession would have higher armor levels, you're not able to equip armor with more armor strength. Uh, also, armor in gives benefits. So if we look at um, Master of Whispers here, his gloves give plus five energy. That's an innate bonus. Same with the tunic. These are innate bonuses that caster professions get. He also gets an innate plus one energy regen on two of his pieces of armor. Without armor, all characters have the same stats in these regards. But with armor, Master of Whispers, or my character, for example, who is got similar properties, right? Plus five energy, plus five energy, plus one regen, plus one regen, have more overall energy compared to somebody like Koss. Koss doesn't get that benefit. Now, you can't see it here. I'd have to bring up his panel, but you can see he has only 20 energy and two pips of energy regen. That's a side effect of his armor. So even if I made my um, secondary on my monk here, warrior, I would not be able to equip warrior armor. I wouldn't be able to get benefits or downsides, depending upon how you look at different things, of those pieces of armor. Another thing that's a consequence of that is I cannot equip specific runes or insignia for my secondary profession. So survivor is a generic one that everyone can have, but if I were to, for example, want to use one of the uh, ones that Necromancer has, Tormented uh, Insignia, which gives plus 10 armor but increases the amount of holy damage you receive, I can't apply that even if I make my secondary necromancer. And, more critically, I cannot apply runes from my secondary profession. I have no way of increasing these like I can my primary profession attributes. So my secondary profession attributes, they're just going to kind of have to be wherever I set them. This gives an inherent advantage to your primary attributes in a couple of different ways. You can potentially... Uh, be a little lighter on how much you invest in them to invest more heavily in your secondary or your secondary profession to increase those attributes more while not as sacrificing as much from your primary profession. But it also means your primary profession attributes can reach higher heights than your secondary profession can. So these are a couple of really important things to keep in mind. You do, however, get all skills. This includes skills in the primary profession. So, for example, if I uh, earn the, the primary attribute, if I go over to uh, Prius of Hexen here, he does have divine favor skills. He has access to all of them, but because he can't raise the attribute level in any of them, they're pretty much all garbage for him. Most of these skills just don't do anything without an, an investment of attribute points. Withdrawal Hexes does, but Withdrawal Hexes is its own monster. Um... But anyway, the, the important part of all of this is that sometimes this is relevant. So, for example, there's a spawning prayer or a spawning power skill uh, called Sight Beyond Sight. It lasts for 
good healthy period of time when you can invest in it. But even without any investment in spawning power, you get about seven seconds out of it. This is actually can be useful in certain areas. So it's something I'll talk about again in the individual areas. But it's important to be aware of. You can make use of these and sometimes, very rarely, it's worth doing so. Okay, now there is one thing that I want to cover before I kind of go into other details just about skills specifically. There are a few specific types of skills. I'm not going to go into every single skill type. If you want more information on that, you can either go to the Guild Wars wiki or you can check out the article that I wrote. Uh, but to quickly cover a couple of important categories of skills, there are uh, spells. So they will say spell. For example, this is an elite spell. Uh, this is just a normal spell. I'll talk about elites in a moment. Enchantment spell. Um, hex spell. This is important because there's lots of things that qualify as spells, and there are a number of skills that specifically care about things being spells. Every skill is at its base a skill. So if something refers to a skill, it refers to any possible skill on your skill bar. But if it's a spell, uh, which there are many spells in the game, it specifically is referring to something that's a spell. This is an example of something that's not. This is a signet. Signets all have the same sort of characteristic. They do not cost any energy to use, but they usually have a longer activation time or longer recharge to compensate for that. Energy, of course, is this blue bar right here, uh, and skills cost energy. If you see the little blue bubble right here, this costs 5 energy to use. This one costs 10. Pretty straightforward. This is HP, of course. So all skills have their own sort of thing that they do. Enchantments are notable. They are unique buffs. Uh, hexes are unique debuffs. So, for example, pacifism here on the target prevents them from being able to attack, but it does end if they take damage. There are many different types of hexes. I'm not going to go over all of them. There are some more specialized skill types that I'll go over uh, in when I talk about specific professions, when they come up. Profession, of course, being what this game calls classes. So here you can see I am a Monk Ritualist. I can change to a Monk Assassin or a Monk Paragon. There are a total of 10 professions in the game. If I look at my heroes, uh, Koss here is a Warrior. Uh, also, it's part Dervish. There's Necromancer. There's Mesmer. Uh, Paragon. Ritualist is mentioned. Assassin. Elementalist, which is kind of a generic mage. Uh, Dervish. I'll go into all of these in individual videos. I'm not going to do a whole lot of details now. Um, but they're broken up. Roughly half of them are focused as physical attackers. So that's going to be Assassin, Paragon, Dervish, Warrior, and Ranger. And half are more focused as spellcasters, which is going to be uh, Monk, Mesmer, Elementalist, Necromancer, and Ritualist. But I'll go into each one in more details. Technically, anybody can wield a weapon if you make your secondary one that has an attribute uh, that it has a weapon. So specifically, I guess I might as well talk about that briefly. Uh, so right here is an axe. It's a dwarven axe of enchanting. It has some stuff. I'll talk about weapons more in a moment. But this has uh, a requirement of nine axe mastery. Axe mastery is a warrior attribute line. This weapon's effectiveness correlates to the number of uh, to the rank I have in axe mastery. So right now I don't have any Axe Mastery. I can still wield this weapon. Uh, I can, in fact, uh, equip it if I want to. Uh, this is an example of a spear that I use. Uh, the benefit of this is that it is ranged. Spears are a ranged weapon in this game. They're thrown kind of like javelins. I'll go out in the outpost here and show you what that looks like. But you'll notice that this weapon is rated for 14 to 27 lightning damage. Uh, and if I attack this, it's going to do piddly damage, two to three damage, probably. That's because I don't meet the attribute requirement. If we switch over to this staff, which I do meet the attribute requirement for and begin attacking, it's going to do that 11 to 22 damage. Pretty straightforward. So that's how attributes work. Um, I should also mention there are attack skills. This character doesn't have any. They're used by weapons. Um, and... That's kind of like the major categories. There's also things like shouts and chants and whatnot, but a lot of those I'll cover more uh, at the time. Stances are also a relevant category of skill. But again, I'll talk about those more um, in individual videos. If you want more details, again, link in the description uh, for more details. So weapons. Let's talk about those for a moment. 
This is a green weapon, which means it's kind of a special legendary weapon with a special name. Uh, but a lot of weapons are going to be gold or something like that. That's rare. So weapons have two to three modifiers applied to them depending upon their handedness. In other words, this is a two-handed weapon, so it gets three modif modifications. Uh, something like a spear or shield is two-handed, so it only gets two. Now, a lot of these are going to be green weapons just because it's convenient. I know what they do. I know how they work, all that sort of thing. They're specific things, specifically easy to acquire. Um, but this is more illustrative for discussing things. So if you notice, this says it's an insightful Mersat Divine Staff of Fortitude. Insightful and Fortitude are two modifiers. Insightful gives me plus 5 energy. Fortitude gives me plus 29 HP because this one's not maximum. The maximum would be plus 30. And then it has an inscription, Hail and Hardy, which gives me plus 5 energy while my health is above 50%. This Dwarven Axe, on the other hand, has the inscription, I have the power, which gives me plus 5 energy just straight up. Only goes in martial weapons, however. This is an enchanting axe. It gives me plus 20% uh, longer enchantment duration. It can have another modifier on the front uh, for things like damage type. For example, this spear technically has a lightning modifier to make it do lightning damage instead of piercing. And otherwise, its mods are very similar to the axe. The shield has a inscription in, in it that gives it a 20% chance of reducing physical damage by 5 whenever you would receive it. And plus 30 health, so it has a fortitude modifier. There's a number of different modifiers. If the name is the same, then the effect is the same. So, for example, defensive, uh, a defense modifier, increases armor by 5. Warding increases armor specifically against elemental damage by plus 7. I believe there's another one. There's a couple more specialized ones that I don't use because the additional two armors over defense is just meaningless. There are a number of just different useful ones. Just be aware that they exist. You can kind of customize your weapons. There's a couple of relevant ones to bring up with physical attacking ones. So notably, this for example is icy. That means it deals cold damage. So for melee weapons or for physical attacking weapons, I should say, uh, you can get modifiers that change the element damage type. So for example, by default, a scythe would deal slashing damage. This one deals cold because it's icy. It also has damage plus 15% while enchanted. That's the inscription. Enchanting is a common one. It On uh, various equipment, it increases enchantment duration by 20% at maximum rating, of course. All of these can come in weaker categories for the most part. Elemental mods don't. But the, a couple of other relevant physical ones. Sundering gives you a 20% chance to have 20% armor penetration on attacks. That one's popular. I'm not a big fan of it, but it doesn't hurt anything, obviously. There's Vampiric, which gives you lifesteal. Lifesteal goes through most defenses, uh, but a Vampiric weapon does give you minus one HP degeneration, which is equivalent to two HP per second. And then there is Zealous, which gives you minus one energy regeneration, so minus one pip of this, but you gain one energy whenever you hit with an attack. Those are all pretty common. So... Let's talk about armor. Right here we have a suit of 60 armor. Uh, I should switch to this because it actually deals damage. You'll notice that this is dealing somewhere in that sort of standard range of 11 to 22 damage. If I attack the 80 armor, it's going to go down. Now it's dealing like 9, 10, 11. But it's not going to get as high. Uh, 14, 15, those all seem pretty reasonable. Here's 100 armor. Now, this is going to deal half the damage that 60 armor does. So, the armor formula in this game is, and I guess you'd call it an inverse uh, exponential formula. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on screen. But it's something to the general effect of 2 to 60 minus armor level over 40. So, the way this works is if I have 60 armor, I have a 1 times multiplier to damage pretty straightforward. If I have 20 armor, I have a 2 times multiplier to damage, so I will take double damage. If I have 100 armor, I have a 1 half multiplier. I will take half damage. Because it's an exponential, it never actually goes to zero, although rounding will eventually cause any multiplication to effectively be zero, because it's going to get very small. 
In general, armor values in the game ranged from about 60 to maybe 120 or so. In low level areas, you'll sometimes encounter armor under 60. In higher level areas, you'll often encounter armor above 80 or 100. It's really relevant because things like attacks. Uh, so, for example, if I go back to town and load on, say, Koss, you'll notice that Koss has a skill here that says it hits for plus 33 damage. You can see this is melee attack. It is performed with a weapon. It has to be a melee weapon specifically, so you cannot use it with spears or bows, but you can use it with the other types. You'll notice there are axes, hammers, swords, axe mastery, hammer mastery, swordsmanship. There's also daggers, uh, scythes, uh, bows, and spears. Uh, but this specifically will work with any melee weapon. And if it hits, it deals plus 33 damage. That plus 33 ignores armor. It's applied after the armor calculation. That means that this attack will get through on higher armor targets for more damage. Uh, than an ordinary attack would, just auto-attacking. This is relevant because there are things like this right here. It says all adjacent foes are struck for 26 cold damage. That 26 cold damage cares about armor. It will be reduced by armor or increased by armor if armor is low. Uh, I'll talk a lot more, more about some of this stuff when I talk about the elementalists specifically because armor is extremely relevant to that profession, but you'll routinely hear that such and such a thing ignores armor. And that's what it's about. And and again, armor is calculated on a per piece basis. Uh, there are additional things that can increase your armor, of course. Uh, a good example of that is this crude shield of fortitude. It will give me plus eight armor because I don't meet the requirement. If I did meet the requirement, it would give me the full 16. Plus 16 armor obviously does help. It's not going to be like having damage or anything, but it counts. It adds up. Warriors in general have a bit more armor. You'll notice that uh, they cap out at 80 armor and they have an additional 20 armor against physical damage. That means that a warrior has 80 armor against elemental damage and 100 armor against physical sources. Monks, on the other hand, just have 60 base armor. This is usually the case with most casters. So that's kind of enough on armor, I think. I'm going to leave cost here. Let's go ahead and talk about conditions. On my way over to the handy dandy condition testing area, there's a number of other things I'm going to touch on here. I do want to mention that most of my analysis of skills is going to revolve around the way that I play the game, which is mostly with heroes in PvE. I may touch upon PvP stuff, but generally that's going to be based on old recollections from when I did do PvP. And it's not as relevant to what my analysis is. So conditions are specifically debuffs that, in general, come from a lot of different sources. So while hexes are unique to the skill that creates them, a lot of different things can create conditions. So, for example, if we look at Koss right here, this skill, um, Crippling Victory, it will inflict the crippled condition for 7 seconds if it hits a foe. Body Blow will inflict Deep Wound on a foe that has cracked armor. Both of those are conditions. We're going to just go down this line uh, that's a mixture of enemies and allies. You can see there's disease, dazed, weakness, poison, blind, crippled, burning, bleeding, deep wound, and cracked armor. So let's start with diseased. Diseased gives you four pips of health degeneration. As I mentioned, one pip is equal to two HP per second. If you have degeneration, it goes down. If you have regeneration, such as applied by healing breeze, which gives plus 8 health regeneration, it goes up. Note that you're capped in both directions to a maximum of 10. So you cannot have a maximum of 10 degeneration or a maximum of 10 regeneration. And that's true, I should mention, for energy as well, as I recall. But disease causes 4 pips of health regeneration, which is 8 HP per second. It also, as you'll notice, it says right here, it's contagious between creatures of the same kind. So if Koss came over here and I stood near him, my disease could pass on to him. It's a relevant thing, but for the most part, it's just a bit of damage. There are enemies that are non-fleshy. They are, they are immune to disease, uh, bleed, and poison. So they are resistant to a, a number of these things. Uh, I'm going to come out here and heal myself up because I did stand in that for quite a while. So the next one is Dazed. 
Dazed is an anti-caster. You'll notice that it specifically talks about spells. It says, while dazed, you take twice as long to cast spells. So if you'll notice, uh, I apply Healing Breeze way more slowly. But it doesn't affect the length of Signets. This is the normal length of time for a Signet of Devotion. It also says, all your spells are easily interrupted. All that means is if you take physical damage. Uh, so when I say physical damage, I mean you're hit by an attack. Um, so either like this, for example. So if I auto attack her and she attacks me, you'll notice if I try to use this, she interrupts me. That means the skill doesn't go off. That's specifically how they work. And now some skills are very quick casting. This is quarter second cast time. Uh, shielding hands is, it's probably going to get off regardless, but that's dazed. Um, next we have weakness. Weakness reduces your physical damage by quite a lot. So if you see, I attack this guy. Now I'm hitting him for like fours instead of the 11 to 22. It also notably reduces all of your attributes by one. This is a, something that was added later in the game to make it affect casters. Casters generally don't care about their attack damage, but Reducing all of your uh, attributes by one can be very significant if your skills... Like, it just makes them a little bit weaker, right? But if your skills have specific breakpoints... So, a good example of that would probably be Shield of Absorption. You notice it lasts for six seconds. It's possible that at certain attribute points, and you might spec for this, you'll hit exactly at that level to be able to get it to last for one second longer, which can matter quite a bit. And it... That effect can be even more severe on um, other skills that maybe have very specific requirements to use them, things like that. I don't have any great examples offhand, but uh, the assassin attribute line of critical strikes stands out. We'll talk about that when I talk about the assassin. Um, let's get this guy to stop attacking me. Cast pac pacifism on him. Next we have poison. Poison is really similar to disease it causes 4 hp degen but it does not spread that's really all there is to say about it blind is uh pretty significant what it does is it reduces chance to hit with attacks specifically attacks this does not affect spells uh spells do not have a hit chance like this but this means that most of your attacks will miss an attack that misses doesn't do anything as you'd expect um next we have crippled Crippled, as you can tell, gives you this lovely movement animation of limping, and it makes you slow. It halves your movement speed. That's what Crippled does. That's really relevant, though. Movement and positioning is really important in this game. So, Burning, as the name suggests, makes you look like you're all on fire. Also, you'll notice I have serious HP degen. Specifically, I have seven. This is the strongest degeneration condition in the game, but that's all it does is it degenerates you very strongly. Burning doesn't usually last very long, but 14 HP per second is nothing to scoff at. Bleeding is the weakest degeneration condition in contrast. It is three pips of health degen. Still adds up, but definitely not as much. There are a number of things that look for bleeding, so it tends to be more useful as a utility or side effect than it is a straight up effect. Um, but, you know, that's what it does. Uh, you'll notice that different conditions will color my HP bar. So I have a pink bar when I'm bleeding. Um, burning does not change it. I do have this little arrow down when I have them. Um, poison and disease will both decrease my, or will both make my bar green. Hexes that degenerate your health, there are many, uh, will make it purple. And you also get the purple down arrow if you're hexed. Uh, so if I hex this guy, for example, with pacifism, you'll notice he has the purple marker indicating that state. And if I select myself and apply an enchantment, I get the yellow up arrow indicating as such. Uh, finally, uh, well, not finally, finally, but we have deep wounds next. This does two things. The first is it reduces your maximum HP by 20%. You'll notice the gray bar here. That is indicating that reduction. The other thing is it reduces the healing you receive by 20% as well. Uh, I think that's about... It. Anyways, it reduces the benefit you receive from healing. This is important because what it means is that effectively you are functioning as, at a detriment uh, with less HP. What's really important about that 
is it means that your healing is not proportionately more effective because you have less HP. It can matter. There is notably a monk enchantment uh, right here, protective spirit, that caps damage to 10% of your max HP. So that sort of thing can matter. Um, the other really important thing about this is it takes the HP off of the bottom of your health, not the top. What I mean by that is right now you'll notice I have 475 HP. If I heal myself, I go up to 575. It does cap at 100. It won't take more than 100 HP. But because it comes off the bottom, when it goes away, it gives me, me my full HP back. But if I had damage ahead of time, so for example, if I come over here, uh, this is going to be faster. Uh, so I have maximum degeneration by kind of getting both of these applied. So my HP is going way down, way down, way down. Now if I get deep wound on me, you'll notice that I go way down. Because it's coming off the bottom, that means my I'm effectively taking 100 HP of damage, you can think. Um, and eventually that, that will recover, and then I get all of that HP back. So that's a way of quickly applying a huge amount of damage with that condition. Finally, we have Cracked Armor. It's It was added later to try to reduce, dura to allow you to be able to kind of counteract the durability of certain classes, uh, certain professions. Each profession has their own set of armor with its own characteristics. Um, you can't apply runes and insignias that belong to another profession to armor of your profession. Uh, they all have their own looks, but significantly here, this reduces armor by up to 20 but it won't reduce it below 60. So you'll note that this means that you'll enable people to take full damage from attacks, but you can't make them take more damage from attacks. In my mind, this is a little bit of an oversight, but I'll talk about that later, uh, probably particularly when I'm talking about um, Elementalist. Anyway, that is the good old master of conditions. That's kind of stuff about conditions. Uh, let's talk about area of effect next. So these are some useful rings that they have for them. Uh, so this one is specifically more for looking at tar targets. Um, so here's my target. If something targets adjacent, it has this area. It's very small. Um, but it's it's this this outer ring here. Um, nearby is this ring. In the area is this ring. It's much bigger. You'll also hear Earshot. If you look over at this map, you'll notice this white bubbly thing in the middle, this white circle in the middle. That's known as the aggro range. Um, things, The AI will not aggro on you in that range. It's also Earshot. So anything that affects in Earshot affects in that range. Um, so that's kind of area of effect. So this is kind of like um because that's adjacent so if if i had a skill that did it i should probably do that actually let's go ahead and summon Koss and bring him up he is equipped with a scythe which specifically targets uh adjacent foes it'll take him a moment to get here tell him to charge so he can get here more quickly uh so he's going to go and attack this target and you'll notice that he'll also damage the adjacent target but this one's a little bit too far away. That's kind of very on the edge of adjacent. Yep, there, there it hit. So you can see that it can hit that one. Um, I should mention that there are critical hits in this game. All they do is mean you get a max damage roll. So the 11 to 22, it would roll the 22. And it gives a little bit of additional armor penetration and some other things. Over here we have uh, these hexes. So I mentioned hex degeneration right here this is applying a torch hex um which just tells you what hexes do uh maybe this one yeah this one gives you degeneration so you can kind of see what that looks like um two hp per second is not a whole lot but that's kind of an overview of those so I'm over here on my warrior because I need to talk about a mechanic called adrenaline. Adrenaline is this little, I don't know what you want to call it. It's technically like a fist with a red thing around it. It's pretty small there. But adrenaline is a mechanic that belongs to three of the professions, which is why I'm not talking about it in an individual profession video, although I'll potentially bring it up. Adrenaline belongs to warriors, paragons, and dervishes. And the way that it works is when you attack something... 
you begin to get str what's called a strike of adrenaline. So you can see that this skill is slowly going up in adrenaline. This one's capped out. Each time you hit, you get one strike of adrenaline. When you take damage, you also get a little bit of adrenaline. Adrenaline is actually like... I don't, I don't know the exact figure about, but about 20 to 25 uh, points per strike. Taking damage will give you some amount of that, which is a thing, but it doesn't come up much. Now, if you're not in combat, if you're not taking damage or dealing damage for a long enough period of time, as you just saw, all of my adrenaline skills, Lion's Comfort, Fierce Blow, and Forceful Blow, all drained of their adrenaline. This is important because it means that making sure you're keeping your adrenaline up in battle for these professions is important, and also these skills start at zero. The other thing you'll notice is these don't have... Well, I mean, this has an activation time and a recharge. Um, but these are attack skills. Adrenaline skills are mostly attack skills, although not entirely, as this here, Lion's Comfort, proves. But the way adrenaline works is uh, it usually doesn't have a recharge, because when you expend it, you have to build it all the way up again to be able to use it. So let's go ahead and attack this target a few times to build up my adrenaline level. Now, I can use Forceful Blow. When I used Forceful Blow, a couple of things happened. One, it drained of adrenaline, and then the hit happened and gave it a strike back. The other thing is, when I use it, all of my other skills refresh on their adrenaline. If I use Lion's Comfort, you'll notice uh, this actually gives me three strikes of adrenaline when I use it, which is why it has recharge. Recharging skills cannot gain adrenaline like skills can't grant, gain adrenaline while they're on recharge um but gaining adrenaline or using a skill that costs adrenaline so when i do this before i hit again you'll notice that it goes down adrenaline drains from all of your other skills that have adrenaline when you use it so again, activate it, everything goes down. It drains a strike from all of them. Usually you'll get that strike back, so it'll be a net zero. But it's important to be aware of that mechanic. Uh, I think that it only does it for full skills that are full on adrenaline. But what it means is if you miss, it can kind of lower things. And, and it definitely has a huge impact on skills that cost adrenaline but are not attacks. Because it can delay your attacks. So adrenaline is just an important mechanic to be aware of. Um, I think I've covered the basics of it. As things might come up, uh, nuance comes up, I'll talk about it. But it's important to be aware of. Also, I should mention this hammer right here has what's called a Furious uh, mod. It gives a 10% chance that the hit will double adrenaline gain, which usually means that you'll get two strikes instead of one. It helps uh, build up adrenaline skills and is useful if you have a lot of them. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this section on Adrenaline. Now, something I forgot to mention when talking about skills, you'll notice that this is an elite skill. What's particularly relevant about that, let me pop back to my guild hall, is that you can only have one elite skill on your bar at a time. So right now I have Blessed Light. If I try to put Word of Healing, another elite skill, on, it takes Blessed Light off. That's really all there is to say about them. Elite skills can be more powerful than regular skills, but... It all varies, and we'll talk about that in much more detail when we actually discuss them. So I think that covers most of the details of what I wanted to discuss in this opening episode. Uh, of course, like I said, there are a lot of professions. There are ten, in fact. So we'll be looking at Warrior and Ritualist and Mesmer and Dervish and Assassin and Necromancer and Elementalist and Ranger. Probably this monk. Paragon. And uh, all, all in good time, all in their proper time. Uh, but for now, that's kind of the details that I wanted to cover. Uh, I do want to quickly discuss the rubric I'll be using. So, the rating system that I'm going to be using has a 5, meaning that this is a skill I almost always bring with me. So, I can give an example of that. A powerful example, actually, uh, is shielding hands. I almost always have my monks equipped with shielding hands. So that's a really strong example of a five. A four is basically if I'm looking for this type of effect, this is my go-to. So an example of this would be 
Duena's Kiss is a common go-to for healing. Uh, but it's probably a little bit better. Like, Fear Me is just generally a useful skill. Uh, Charge is a skill that I often use when I'm looking for this effect. So these are some examples of skills that can kind of fall into that category. A three is like just a solid sort of bread and butter skill. I think kind of a classic example of that would actually be Cleave right here. This is an elite skill, but it's... Just a fine skill. It's not bad, but it's not great. And so it's usually going to be eclipsed by fours and fives. Two is specifically a skill that is very narrow. So I'm only going to bring it for very specific things. Healer's Boon is a really good example of that. This is a powerful skill, but it's very narrow. I'm only going to really use it in a specific build. Uh, another good example of that actually is Warrior's Endurance. Uh, this is the PvP version, but... This is a skill that I will use in very specific builds, but I'm generally not going to use it otherwise. It's not just a skill you slot onto your bar. So these are going to be things that are going to be build around me's. So stuff like War Warrior's Endurance is a really good example of that. And then finally we have Ones. Ones are skills that are basically utter trash that I'd never consider bringing with me ever. The best example that I have of that is not actually a skill I have on this character because it, there's no reason to go get it. Uh, skills cost money to acquire, but Withdraw Hexes is a prime example. This is a one. This skill is utter trash. I will explain why it is utter trash when I talk about monks, obviously. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the general rubric. So keep in mind that a skill of two doesn't mean a skill is bad. It means it's narrow. Uh, or it means that it doesn't slot into a whole lot of builds. It might be very unique, it might be very powerful at what it does, but that effect is just not commonly needed. It's not a general purpose skill. Your very powerful general purpose skills are going to tend to be four and fives. Your uh, And five, fours are going to be kind of like the bread and butter of like the skills I'm usually bringing with me. Threes are going to be kind of filler. They're going to be okay. They're not bad, but they're not great. Um... And then twos are going to be narrow build around me's. Ones are just going to be bad, awful skills that I almost never... In fact, I don't think I'd ever be able to have a legitimate reason to want to bring it with me. So that's the general plan. The rubric is, again, on the website, and I'm going to bring it up the entire videos when I actually review skills. So I think that more or less covers everything that I wanted to talk about now. So I'm going to go ahead and say farewell. So until things begin, everyone, take care. And goodbye. Oh, and I should add that I'm planning on these being Saturday videos, so it's going to be for a little while. Goodbye, everyone, and farewell. <laughs>